Welcome to the Bear Marriage Podcast. I'm Sheila Ray Gregoire from to love, honor, and vacuum.com, where we like to talk about healthy, evidence based biblical advice for your marriage and sex life. I am joined today by my husband, Keith. Hey, everybody. And I just want to say um, I mentioned this before at the beginning of the year, but we hit a million downloads on this podcast on December 31st, which was Yay. really a big boost for us. That's that great. was that was really nice to see, especially on the last day of the year. And we're really grateful for all of our listeners. And if you have not rated, or reviewed the podcast yet, please, wherever you listen on, on Apple Music, on Spotify, wherever you go, wherever you listen, just go and, and rate it five stars. Give us a review so other people can see it. And speaking of other ways that you can encourage us, did you know that we have a Patreon group? It's really fun. Mm -hmm. You haven't joined yet. You keep I meaning to not. join. I haven't. Yes, yeah, so that you can be part of all the fun. <laughs> I know, because people keep wanting your opinion on stuff. Okay. But we have, we okay. have a really big Facebook group um, that's extremely active. Rebecca and Joanna do unfiltered podcasts where you hear what they really think about stuff. Um, and it, it's it's a really fun group. The purpose of the patron group is to support our research and fund it because we have no way of funding or monetizing getting our research into peer-reviewed journals and um, other social media channels. And that's what Rebecca and Joanna are busy doing. So if you want to join our patron, um, there is a link in the show notes. It's just patron.com slash bare marriage. And you can do that as well. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, back on the home front, <laughs> we're having some fun on another exclusive Facebook group, which is our launch team for our two new books, all new, completely revised Good Girl's Guide to Great Sex mm -hmm. and The Good Guy's Guide to Great Sex, which you wrote with me. Yes. Yeah, which I appreciate. I know. It's... I remember 15 years ago, I came to you and I said something <laughs> like, hey, babe, wouldn't you love to get up in front of thousands of people and talk about our sex life. And, yes. Yeah. And, and you looked at me strange, but you did it. <laughs> yeah. It's funny to think that there's actually a published book out there. That yeah. It has my name on it. It's, yeah. It's uh, interesting. Yeah. About sex too. So about that's, sex. that's, that's just weird because you're a pediatrician, but you know, March, March 15th, that book launches, you can pre-order it now. And when you do pre-order it, if you send in your receipt, um, you can get our special evangelical sex report card, which is mm -hmm. kind of cool. Like learn where evangelicals score an A <laughs> and learn where we score an F <laughs> and lots of D's and C's in there too. And you can get uh, access to our launch team, which means you can start reading the books right now. Mm -hmm. Follow the links for the pre-order where you can send your pre-order receipt and you can pre-order Amazon anywhere you want. And then you can join the launch team. So that's, that's super fun. Yeah. Last week on the podcast, you and I kind of did like, um, um, an education session. Oh yes. On the sexual response cycle. Yes. And people really enjoyed it. And so I thought that we could give another education session today okay. on something that we haven't, we haven't talked about in a couple of years. I did a series of, on this on the blog, like four years ago, maybe, mm -hmm. but let's talk about birth control. Sure. So in the book, um, it's funny, the people who are reading through it right now, they're saying the chapter on on birth control and on our definitions in the sexual response cycle is like for them one of the most helpful chapters yeah. and they wish they had read it as teenagers. <laughs> so so we just want to go over the different birth control options. I did a couple of polls on Instagram this week, so I want to tell you what people said about the different birth control options as well and just tell you the pros and cons. We don't really want to give you our opinion because it's not it's not up to us what yeah. you do. And there are a whole lot of different options and there's pros and cons to everything. There's nothing that's yeah. perfect. Yeah, I think one of the things that we do say in our book that you know haven't necessarily seen a lot talked about elsewhere is the idea that it really should be a mutual decision that you're making as a couple. Um, I think a lot of times, a lot of forms of contraception do uh, are mostly for the woman, like the mm -hmm. oral contraceptive pills, IUDs, things like that, they affect the woman's body rather than the man's body. Mm -hmm. And so we sort of assume it's something that they're going to take care of and a lot of guys back off. Um, and I think that you should make what's a good decision for the two of you as a couple. Together. Yeah, exactly. And and of course, whenever you talk about birth control, we do get into a little bit of, of hot water. Because, Controversy. Well, this or, is a controversial yeah, subject. Yeah. You know, first of all, the traditional Catholic view, but it's also held by, by many Protestants, Protestants, Orthodox, yeah. whatever, is that we really should be leaving our fertility to God and yeah. that sex is meant to be life-giving. And so whenever you take away that possibility, mm -hmm. that's actually wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and so birth control is wrong. There's th there's another side which says that any form of hormonal therapy or anything like that, anything that's unnatural shouldn't be used mm -hmm. because you shouldn't mess with your body. And we just want to say, like, we have a lot of... of 
sympathy, respect for both of those views. Yeah. You know, this is birth control is just a difficult thing yeah. and you've got to weigh a lot of issues. So we're not going to tell you what we think. We're not going to tell you what you should do. What we yeah. just want to do is explain the different methods and, and give you the pros and cons so that you yeah. can make decisions yeah. of your own. And we say that in the book. In the mm-hmm. end, you have to make the decision that works best for your for you as a couple mm-hmm. that fits with your views. Um, and that is guided by, you know, your own medical history too. So, you know, we're not trying to take the place of your, your doctor or whoever looks after your medical care. Uh, we're just trying to give some ideas yeah. for you to think about. Yeah, exactly. So let's start with natural family planning. Yeah. Okay. Which is what we start with in the book. This would be the traditional Catholic, yeah. um, uh, way of looking at the subject. And to do that, we need to explain the reproductive cycle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bit, yeah. Yeah. Because you can't get pregnant any time. There's only a certain time of the month where conception can happen. Uh, to be, you know, quite simplistic, mm-hmm. conception happens when a sperm reaches an egg and mm-hmm. fertilizes that egg. Mm-hmm. Um, so you kind of need a sperm and you need an egg and they need to be in the same place at the same time. And they need to both be alive because, you know, they don't they don't necessarily stay viable all the time. So yes, you need a sperm, you need an egg. And so let's think about day one of her period as day one of her cycle. Okay. So what happens is after your period, you know, your body wants to get pregnant. Okay. Your (laughs) body is saying, oh my gosh, pregnancy might happen. So I need to make sure that I am ready in case pregnancy happens. And And so that's, that's what a period is every year. Yeah. 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 That's what, that's what your period actually is because every month your body makes kind of like a nest. I mean, it's not really a nest, (laughs) but like, let's just say it makes your uterus all ready to have a baby. And And then then if you don't have a baby, if you don't have a baby, it sloughs off and that's what your period is. Yeah, your uterus says, okay, don't need you now, go away. And then <laughs> it goes away and you, you have cramping and bleeding and all of that fun stuff. Um, and this happens every month. And so, you know, you take day one of your period, that's that's day one of your cycle. And most women, sometime between day 11 and 17 hmm. of your cycle, an egg leaves the ovary, goes down, one of your ovaries goes down the fallopian tube and hangs around there for just a little bit of time. Mm. And if it meets the sperm, then you get conception. And then that fertilized embryo goes into the uterus and tries to implant. Mm. And so that's how you get pregnant. Now, and so sperm live about five days or yeah. so. So and the sperm, the they're egg, swimming about five days. Yeah, <laughs> and the egg really is about 24, maybe 48 hours at the, outs, at the yes. absolute max. It's, it's a very short-lived yeah, so you take you look at that and you say, okay, we've got a roughly a seven day window where you could get pregnant, mm-hmm. and you really can't get pregnant outside of that seven yeah. day window because there's not an egg and a sperm that yeah. are viable. Because either the the sperm gets there, and if the egg's already, you know, died, then nothing can happen. Mm-hmm. Or similarly, if the if the egg shows up and if the sperm of if, if there's no sperm in the fallopian tube while the eggs there they're not going to get fertilized right so 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 you think about it like five days before ovulation you have sex the sperm swims Maybe around for a bit around. <laughs> hang around for a bit and then meets the egg right as the egg comes or you know the egg's been hanging around for a day for a day and the sperm meets it so you got the, the, roughly seven days there so theoretically all you have to do is just not have sex in those seven days and you can't get pregnant the problem is... <laughs> yeah, there's, two, there's two problems with that, actually. The first problem is tracking it. Yeah. Because not everybody is totally regular, and mm-hmm. it's not as simple as the day, because your mm-hmm. period could be a little earlier or later. Um, and we can talk a little bit about yeah. how to handle that. But the second thing is, is that that also means that there's at least a week, a month, where you're not engaging. You, you're yeah. not allowed to have sexual intercourse, because that's when you're at your... And that week is right when her hormone levels are the highest. And so her libido is likely to be highest. So that's kind of a bummer. But one of the issues with tracking is that it's much easier to track ovulation than it is to Mm. track five days before ovulation. (laughs) (laughs) And you need to know when that five days before ovulation is. So there's a number of different methods. There's the Creighton method, Marquette method. Billings um, method. there are so many apps for this. Like really, if you want to get yeah. into this, there are so many apps for this. The nice thing is 
It's totally natural. You're not messing around with your body. Um, you get to know your body really well. Once you know the signs of that window and the fertilization window, it's often a lot easier to get pregnant too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so there's yeah, so Yeah, because it works well the other way. It's like, yeah, yeah we know the prime times to get pregnant. Exactly. Right? So. so there's so many apps for this. Um, great book, Taking Charge of Your Fertility. It's kind of been like the fertility Bible for the last 25 years. So um, if you want to get educated on that, you can. So that's called natural family planning. Mm-hmm. The big thing I would say before we go on to the next thing is uh, for the guys out there is you know it's a lot of work to do all this tracking um, because it's not just a matter of looking at the days in the calendar like there's doing basal temperatures in the morning there's stuff with cervical mucus it, it's actually a very involved process trying to find out when you actually ovulate as a woman mm-hmm. and one of the criticisms of this method is that it puts a lot of work on the woman and so you know if, if this is something you as a couple do want to practice uh, then I would just challenge you husbands out there to take on some of that mental load and mm-hmm. to be engaged and involved in this and helping um Mm -hmm. being supportive okay here's uh, just a note that i got when i asked on instagram about all of this from a woman she says i've never used any artificial contraception i'm catholic and we follow god's design for sex and marriage it's very cool how he created us and gave us the intelligence to understand it and use it to achieve or avoid pregnancy based on what we determine is best for our family each month it isn't always easy but it is beautiful Mm-hmm. So there's a woman who really likes it. And again, it's not only Catholics who do do this too. So that's natural family planning. I want to skip fertility awareness method for a minute and go into some of the other things. Then we'll, we'll return to fertility awareness method at the end. Next, the biggest one though, when you think of birth control, what's the first thing you think of? It's the pill, right? Mm-hmm. That tends to be the, the, the go-to method is the pill. And mm-hmm. the pill actually is a misnomer yeah, because there isn't a pill. <laughs> yeah, there's many different types of pills and mm-hmm. they have different levels of the hormones involved. Some of them have only one hormone, some have two. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're not always pills. There's, uh, there's you know, vaginal rings, there's um, skin implants, there's patches. Mm-hmm. There's all kinds of ways of delivering those hormones. Yeah. And people either love the pill or they hate it. Mm-hmm. So here is what 4,000 of my followers said about the pill. Okay. okay. I asked them, do you like it? Do you not like it? said they love it and 85% said they hate it. (laughs) Okay. So for some women, it works really well. And for some, they just don't like it. Now the 85% who hate it, I'm not sure that all of them tried it. Some of them may have just said they hated it because they hate the idea of it. Probably the 15% who love it have actually used it. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think it's as stark as that. I think a lot of people who said that they hate it have never tried it. But there are a lot of people who, who really don't like it. Um, I've had so many women say, you know, I started marriage on the pill, which a lot of people really like to do because you can actually determine when your period's going to be to make sure it doesn't fall on your honeymoon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and then you don't, you know, as long as you take the pill every single day at the same time, you can't miss one, then um, you're, you're good to go. And so a lot of women like it because it's, it's like 99% effective. Mm-hmm. It's great for that. Um, but I've had so many women say, um, you know, I was on the pill for three years. I came off it to get pregnant and I could not believe how much my libido changed. Mm-hmm. So I just, I never realized it was affecting me because they weren't having sex before they were married. So she didn't, yeah. she didn't know the difference. And, and in our book, we talk about the fact that there's a lot of debate about this. Like, mm-hmm. It seems to be very individual because there's some women who there's their libido actually may even increase on the pill. And mm-hmm. there's others who it really tanks. Yeah. So it's very individual. It is very individual. Some women find it really affects their moods and some don't. And often, some, you know, yeah. if one formulation doesn't work, another formulation might. Mm-hmm. The other thing I would say about the pill is that there are certain medical conditions where you shouldn't take the pill or you should only take it under the advisement of your doctor. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I think that you should be discussing it with your healthcare practitioner. The thing with the pill that is important to realize, though, is like if you get sick, that can mess mm-hmm. with ovulation. You know, if you miss a pill or two for whatever yeah. reason... Um, that can cause you to ovulate. And if you had sex like earlier. <laughs> yep. And if you're the person who forgets to take pills. Or yeah. Like that, so yeah. you really need to be very careful to take at the same time every day. Mm-hmm. There was some concern earlier that uh, the pill did. Well, people say that the, the, the hormones in the pill actually change the lining of the uterus. And so there's a theoretical concern that does it, pre- does it have some role in pre- preventing implantation? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but the things I would say about that are, number one, is that it, it, it really appears from this, the most recent studies we have that it, the, the way that the pill works is contraception. It, it prevents fertilization from occurring. And, and those same hormones are present when you're breastfeeding. Yeah. So, you know, so 
does that mean we should never have sex as long as we're breastfeeding because there's a possibility that implantation could happen during mm-hmm. breastfeeding? Like, so and these are very difficult, thorny issues. Uh, but, but I would say that the most recent studies do suggest that contraception is the way the pill works. Yeah, that, so it, it actually stops you from ovulating. It doesn't just stop implantation. All right, mm. so that's the pill. So next one, let's go to other, other things that women can use, which is the IUD. Yeah. Um, IUD is, it's, it's, it looks like a T-shaped device, mm-hmm. which um, gets implanted, gets put up there put <laughs> by a the physician. That's so, what intrauterine means. Yeah, right? so it goes, it, it goes through the cervix into the uterus, and the, the putting it in there is not the most comfortable experience. <laughs> <laughs> but once it's in there, it can stay in there for like years and mm-hmm. doesn't need to be replaced, and it has basically about 100%, 99%. Mm-hmm efficacy mm-hmm. so a lot of people choose iud's after they're done having kids yeah. uh, because you just put it get it put up there and then you don't have to worry about it yeah. um there's copper iud's there's hormonal iud's yeah, there's copper iud's and there's plastic iud's that have hormone that are impregnated mm-hmm. with hormones as well too and again this is another one that classically there's a lot of misinformation that the way the iud works is by preventing implantation mm-hmm. like that's actually mm-hmm. taught that it's that's the method right and, and it's not that's not true to say that. Uh, yeah. You know, I think it's a lot more debatable than the pill about whether mm-hmm. implantation is part of um, how an IUD works. But it's not, you know, it, it, the most recent evidence, again, seems to suggest that it is the way that it works is by contraception. It thickens cervical mucus. Copper is spermicidal. Mm-hmm. Um, the plastic ones have hormones that make it, both the mucus thicker and can also interfere with ovulation as well, too. Mm-hmm. So, again, it's much more nuanced. And I think that, you know, if this is something that's really important to you, the issue of whether implantation is is happening or not, I think you should talk with your doctor uh, and have some really get, get the most up to date information mm-hmm. because, uh, you know, you want to do something that is right for you. But they are fantastic and they work very well and they're very effective. Yeah. And very low. You're not going to forget <laughs> yeah. to take them. Yeah. And we do want to say in our new research of the week segment, mm-hmm. okay, <laughs> we'll put this All in right. our new research of the week. We will link to an article which says that copper IUDs do not appear to prevent implantation. Mm-hmm. So that's not the way they work. It really, it, so if the cervical mucus is thickened, what that means, so the cervix is the opening to the it's uterus. Like the gateway, yeah. Right? So you go up the vagina, through the cervix, into the uterus that's that's mm-hmm. where the sperm goes but if there's if there's a barrier there and the sperm can't get through then you're not going to get conception yeah. and that appears to be what the main the main way that this works mm-hmm. so when we asked people what they thought about IUDs we had 14% of women who have used it and loved it and 86% who haven't used it so again roughly similar to the pill actually yeah. um <laughs> i do think that when when it comes to IUDs more people who have used it liked it Whereas with the pill, a lot of people who use it don't tend to like it. So mm-hmm. there you go. But again, you really, if, if you're worried about the, the issues of preventing implantation, then please, you know, do your research, look up the peer reviewed journals. There's lots of articles on that now. Yeah. Um, okay. Now let's turn to barrier methods. Sure. Okay. So barrier methods, these ones are, would, would normally be called like, like more natural because there aren't hormones you're not messing with the body cycles anything Mm -hmm. like that okay Mm -hmm. um all you're doing is you're putting a barrier between the sperm and the egg so the sperm cannot reach the egg Mm -hmm. and there's there's barriers that she can use and there's barriers that he can use Mm -hmm. so for her she can use a diaphragm which is like it kind of looks like half a ball Mm -hmm. (laughs) like it's just it's just a a rubber i don't even know how to explain it (laughs) well basically it it covers this the cervix and it prevents the the sperm from entering into into yes so you, you can you can insert it like up to a couple hours before intercourse. So it's not like it has to break the mood or anything like that. And then you just take it out afterwards, wash it off and you're good to go. Um, There's also disposable rings that you can get, which can make it easier to have sex during your period if that's what you want to do. And so those can work. Now, I do need to say though, that diaphragms do have the, the, the worst rate (laughs) of pregnancy, like the highest. It depends on how you measure it. Cause there's, Mm -hmm. there's, there's, Optimal use, and then there's practical use, right? Right. But but in practical use, about I think there is a one in six women mm-hmm. uh, per yeah. year get 
pregnant using diaphragms. And the reason is because it's just really difficult to insert it properly. You do need to get fitted by a physician for a diaphragm. And a lot of physicians are really um, trying to get people to switch to other methods just because it does have a higher failure rate mm -hmm. than a lot than, than many other things. So here's a woman who, who likes the diaphragm. She said mm -hmm. this, I had to literally beg my doctor for a diaphragm after feeling like a psycho on the pill. Mm -hmm. She recommended Zoloft to counteract the pill. And so with many like crazy emojis there. Um, yeah. If you have to go on an antidepressant to counteract what the pill is doing to you, that's, that's likely means you're not on a good hormone balance and that's not a good idea for you. She says, I don't know why the diaphragm is passe, but I actually really liked how non-invasive it was once I figured out how to put it in. Um, I think it forces you to know your body and get comfy in all your lady bits. <laughs> so yeah, so that is an option too. Okay, so that's barriers for women. Mm -hmm. The most the commonly used barrier, barrier though men. is actually for men, yeah. and that is the condom. Mm -hmm. um, and the condom, it was the only thing, it got the highest mark. So in our poll, 44% said they liked them and 56% said nope. Okay. So just ain't gonna do it. <laughs> now, when it comes to condoms, of course, mm -hmm. the biggest reason people don't like them is because it takes away sensation. Mm -hmm. for the guy or at least that's what it seems yeah although we you know you, you can make a case for that too in mm -hmm. some circumstances <laughs> yes. but that's a different talk probably well no i mean <laughs> a lot of people said well, if if it, it, there there is some i don't know if this is peer reviewed or, or just in culture but there is a belief that it helps men last longer yeah. because yeah. yeah the sensation is a little bit dull although i do know some people who are you know our age and and older who who started using condoms for health reasons cancer treatments etc and they hadn't used them in like decades and mm -hmm. they're like today's condoms are nothing <laughs> like the condoms from like they're so they're so thin you barely feel them at all so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah the other thing too, I think, is that it kind of breaks the groove, right? Like mm -hmm. you're you're in, having your fun together, and then it's like, okay, we got to stop, put it on, all that sort of stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. But that's a really relatively minimal cost, and and the thing is, is it's pretty safe uh, in the in the absence of like a latex allergy. There's not really any risk to the guy. Mm -hmm. um, they're very available. You know, yeah, yeah. So kind of super you can, easy. When you decide we want to start having babies now, you just yeah. stop using them. So it doesn't do anything to either of your bodies. Doesn't affect fertility at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, what a lot of women say too is the mess is a lot less. So <laughs> it's just easier for cleanup afterwards. So that's a mm -hmm. that's a real pro for a lot of women. Um, here's what one woman said. The use of condoms has caused some issues for us because my husband doesn't love them. But the alternative for us is natural family planning, and I really can't handle having the contraception added to my mental load. Once I explain that, he hasn't mentioned it again, thankfully. And I think that's actually a good point. <laughs> it's like a lot of men don't want to use condoms because it's going to affect how they feel. Mm -hmm. But then... They ask their wives to do something which actually involves, you know, putting hormones into your body. Mm -hmm. And so which actually it's it, it's not just about how you feel. It can affect her moods. It can affect yep. lots and Other lots parts of, of things. Her health as well, too. Yeah. yeah. And it does have increased risks of blood clots. And, um, you know, there there is yeah. some controversy about the risk to breast cancer and things like that. It's very min minuscule. Which, yeah, but. well, it's, it, basically the current recommendation is if you're going to be on a pill, you should talk to your own doctor and mm -hmm. they should assess your personal health risks. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think I think the, the point is if a woman really doesn't want to use the pill and a guy really doesn't want to use the condom and you have to come, you know, you have to yeah. figure something out and those are your only two options. I mean, those aren't your only two options, but if you're thinking of those <laughs> as your only two options. I, I, I tend to think that the person who is going to be more affected gets more of a say yeah. <laughs> and you know, messing, messing with your body mm -hmm. is, is more of an inconvenience and having to remember to take it every single day at a certain time. That's more of an inconvenience than having slightly diminished sensation, which really isn't much at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I think, I think the big thing is we need to take this as a couple and we need to, both people mm -hmm. need to be open to that. And a lot of times, to be honest, I, I've heard you saying like women are, were told by their husbands that this is the way we're going to do it, and mm -hmm. uh, because I don't want to do that, mm -hmm. and it's like you can't dictate. You're going to take all the risks of contraception in our family so that I can have the maximum enjoyment in our sex life. Yeah, that's just not yeah. fair. It's yeah. just not. It's just not appropriate. Yeah. And I would think that a Christian man would want to love his wife as his own body. 
because that is kind of what the Bible tells us to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And here's a woman who says, we use condoms, no more hormones because birth control was awful. And when used right, condoms are pretty reliable and plus they're way less messy. Mm-hmm. So, you yeah. know, a lot of women um, are really quite pro condom. The biggest, the biggest um, response I got too was, you left out vasectomy. Like we're, we love our vasectomy. <laughs> so, which is of course, uh, an option. Um, again, not if you're morally, uh, you feel that it's morally wrong to do anything that messes with your body's ability to be fertile. So for some well, people, and, they and wouldn't see that as an option. That. I, so mm-hmm. I think there's the, the, the moral thing about whether you can change your body permanently to not have children. Mm-hmm. There's a, there's an ethical or moral thing to, for some people. But I think also too, is you don't know what the future is going to hold. Um, and although that you can try and get reversals, you know, there, the longer you've been vasectomized or you know, <laughs> yes. then the, the less chance you're going to retain for regain fertility after that. And we don't know what the future is going to hold. So it is something that we have to take seriously. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you know, if you do decide that, that it, it is an effective way of, well, you've decided you're not going to have any more kids, but just you know, don't go into it lightly, makes it, give some thought to it. Yeah, exactly. And I know that we had, when I, when I did talk about this on my birth control series on the blog, which I will link to in the podcast links and the notes for, for this podcast, one of the issues that, that kept coming up in the comments was women were saying, well, I had to get a tubal ligation because my husband wouldn't get a vasectomy. Mm-hmm. And I found that very difficult because tubal ligations and vasectomies are not equivalent surgeries. Yeah. No, like the tubal ligation, you know, is an actual intra-abdominal operation, right? Mm-hmm. So it requires anesthesia, it requires a hospital, all that kind of stuff. Whereas a vasectomy can be done in a doctor's office and it's, it's, it's a much quicker procedure and it's much more... Because all the parts recovered. are on the outside. Yeah, it's quickly <laughs> recovered from. Now, I think that sometimes, you know, let's say you're, you're, you're having a cesarean section mm-hmm. for a baby that you've now decided, this is the last baby we're going to have it. I would like to get a tubal ligation because mm-hmm. I'm done now and they're going to be in there. You know, I think that that's, that's one thing. But the, I'm not getting a vasectomy, you go get a tubal, and that's the reason you're going to the hospital is to get a tubal and nothing else. Mm-hmm. That bothers me. I mean, that's, that's, that's putting an undue risk on her when you could do a, a much less risky procedure. So if you really believe as a couple, you, would, you should do what's best for you as a couple, you need to take that on, guys. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Last one. So this is, we've mentioned all the, the, the single issues of birth control. There's, there's another thing, which is combining. <laughs> and this one. Um, and I think you said this, you kind of applied this earlier. You might use one method at one point in your relationship and use another one at another point too. That's, right. That's the other thing we, we should say. But even throughout the month, some people combine. Yeah. So yeah. what some people do is they, they take the natural family planning charting stuff mm-hmm. and they do that. But then in that seven day window, they use condoms. Mm-hmm. So they're using a barrier method in that seven day window so they don't have to actually abstain from sex but it means that the rest of the month they don't have to worry about the condoms Mm -hmm. (laughs) and if they're not using anything unnatural in their body so that's Mm -hmm. another that's another option that people really like as well okay a few more comments i just want to share from people one woman said this this one is strange to me so many couples i know don't want to go on the pill don't want natural family planning and are reluctantly getting iud's but anytime i suggest condoms i'm met with silence like no one can explain why they won't use them even though it doesn't (laughs) sound like they actually want to use any of their other methods either (laughs) yeah i think condoms do get a bad rap Mm -hmm. so you know like they are the least invasive uh Mm -hmm. So, you know, try it. If you hate it, then look for something else. Um, But the whole point here is that there is no perfect method. There's no method that is going to be wonderful with no downsides. There's downsides to everything. And you just need to decide as a couple which downsides you're willing to live with. But also... Um, I think a lot of people go for the method is, that is the most reliable, like like that is absolutely going to prevent 100% of pregnancy or whatever. It's actually better <laughs> to yeah, go I, for the method that you're going to stick with 100%. Yeah, because we said earlier, there's like there's perfect use and then there's typical use, mm-hmm. right? So if something has got a really good effectiveness if, as a perfect use, but it's not something you're going to be able to do perfectly, mm-hmm. you're going to do it less well mm-hmm. you actually may have more problems than if you got a method that was not quite as you know effective mm-hmm. but typical use was actually quite good yeah so you just but, gotta know, know yourselves now yeah. okay before we move off of this this one's gonna make you sad oh, there is I'm one sad. other method <laughs> that many people use and mention but you as a doctor could never possibly recommend it which is of course the withdrawal method and oh, i had yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I had many people say you know what we used it for like 15 years, only ever got pregnant when we wanted to. 
it's it's yeah. kind of Russian roulette. I mean, like there is there is um, pre ejaculate that is released before orgasm in men, and and there can be sperm in it. So it's it's kind yeah. of a bit of a yeah. I could yep. not recommend that because yes, as a doctor, you could not recommend that. But but we do want to acknowledge. You know what? A lot of people, people do, do it, that, yeah. and it's really up to you guys. And that's I think what we want to say is it is up to you. But just educate yourself, and and, and don't put it all on one person. And talk to your healthcare provider about these things. And when you do, be very clear about what your personal moral views are about things. Um, your your family doctor, you know, may not may not share your your views, but we as physicians are trained to respect and honor the views of other people. And so, if you explain to them what things are really important, and then just ask them about the science, they'll they'll help you navigate to the one that works best for you as a couple. Mm-hmm. All right, so that is our birth control segment. And again, we cover all of this in both The Good Girl's Guide to Great Sex and The Good Guy's Guide to Great Sex, which are wonderful books. You know, Great Sex Rescue was, hey, church, here's all the things you're doing wrong and here's all the bad teachings. We're going to tear them down and try to reframe stuff. Good Girl's Guide to Great Sex and Good Guy's Guide to Great Sex are doing something different. What they're saying is, how can we build something healthy from the ground up? So Mm -hmm. it's not about tearing down. It's like, if we're going to build something healthy and teach something healthy from the very beginning, what is it going to look like? So let's talk about sex being intimate, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. So um, great books for anyone who's just getting married. Great books if you're still trying to figure out what sex is, how sex works. Lots of practical stuff. Lots of practical stuff. Or if you just simply want to understand God's design better. So do check those out. You can pre-order them now. But I want to change direction. Mm -hmm. We're going to bring one of my friends that I've met on Facebook, and he's been such a great ally, Patrick Weaver, onto the Mm -hmm. podcast. Because I invited him here um, to have a conversation about the Twitter blow up last week. About Dear Brian, (laughs) Um, where a pastor from Utah posted that women shouldn't um, put pictures on Instagram of them in V-necks or with their newborn babies or breastfeeding, and they shouldn't show so much skin. And um, that blew up. And so I'm, I was, I invited Patrick on to talk about it. While we were having a discussion, he brought up something where there isn't a lot of context for it. So I just want to mention it now <laughs> so that you'll understand when it comes up. Um, in our book, in our, stu- in our survey for men, we found that roughly 50% of men currently use porn. Mm -hmm. Roughly 50% of married evangelical men currently use porn. And there were some uh, abuse advocates or abuse people who write in the abuse space who were very concerned that our stat was too low. And so we did have a lot of um, attacks before Christmas. I mentioned that briefly on a podcast and last month. And so he is making reference to that. So just so that you know what he's talking about when he when he brings that up. There's your intro, and now I'm just going to bring on Patrick Weaver. Well, I am so happy to have on the Bear Marriage Podcast Patrick Weaver. He is a pastor in the San Francisco Bay Area, and he's a big abuse advocate. I have shared a lot of his stuff on Facebook, and I just love what he does. Patrick, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Originally, when I asked to come I want to talk about abuse but then something happened <laughs> and the internet went crazy <laughs> and you posted it. so I thought you know what let's leave that so um I don't know if it was two days ago or three days ago now at the point where we're recording this will have been last week at the point where this goes live but um a pastor in Utah Brian Sove posted a tweet where he he told women not to post any pictures of their bodies and he listed you know v-necks any skin showing but then he also included like babies and birth stories right and said that you're not supposed to do this i said something on this a bunch of people said something on this and i just want to read what you posted this morning and then i thought we could talk about it so here's what you said when a christian man is told to fix his pornified mentality by telling women to cover from head to toe, the assumption is the pornified mentality is caused by what he's looking at, as opposed to the sinful heart God said he's looking through, Matthew 5, 28 29. Modesty didn't and doesn't stop these same pornified monsters from raping, molesting, assaulting, and sexually harassing women in the church. These same pornified Christian men are picking up prostitutes, frequent, frequent flyers on porn sites, and regulars at strip clubs. A pornified mentality is a sinful heart problem not a woman problem <laughs> so thank you so what's a fortified mentality the sex obsessed crazed 
individuals who lack any control, self-control whatsoever. And they're constantly looking to outsource this lack of self-control onto any uh, pop culture theme and or uh, Christian ideology, uh, whether it be purity culture and or, uh, you know, or, or even modesty, quote unquote, which I can't figure out how those men actually go to the beach. I, I, just... <laughs> I had two, I don't know, we were talking this morning. We were thinking, okay, let's, let's make a list of all the places where men like this can't go. Uh, like you can't go to the mall. You right. can't go to the beach. You no. can't go like, you, you know, you can't go watch a Marvel movie. <laughs> no, no. And I thought, you know, well, maybe they'll start talking about the mannequins and how the mannequins need to also be modest now. So I, yeah. I just can't possibly figure out how these people exist on earth. I just can't. I just can't. You know, that's one of the things that gets me about the modesty message. And and this is a point I've been trying to make over and over again. Is even if every woman in church was covered from head to toe. Right. And she never posted anything on Instagram, like this guy said. Other women would. So if you can't handle it, with your Christian, so you can't handle being out in public. Like the problem's yours. The problem is so yours because, like you said, you can't handle being in public. You can't handle the interaction with humanity. You can't go into a hospital. Somebody's gown might fly open. I mean, <laughs> you're just not. You're not ready for humanity, which only simply says to me, you're emotionally and spiritually immature. Mm-hmm. Aren't calling it that. You're calling it lust. You're calling it all of these other things, or you're calling it someone else's responsibility. But the bottom line being is these are very dangerous, depraved deviants. Mm -hmm. And they're starting now for some odd reason to rear their ugly little heads in these covert ways. And I think what I found most disturbing about what he tweeted was that he included birth stories and being with a newborn baby, which means he is sexualizing that. So it makes me think he can't see a woman as anything other than a sexual object. At all, under any circumstance. And the same thing that I am always curious of when they make those statements do they mean everyone else's daughter or including their own daughter? Mm-hmm. The, everyone else's niece and, 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 and granddaughter, or that's how they look at their niece and granddaughter as well. Yeah. I don't know where the line is drawn with them. Yeah. They can control themselves at home, but not out in public. At the family reunion, but not at your house. I'm, I'm just curious, are they also pornified with their family members? I know, it really is horrifying because Jesus, like, we're all brothers and sisters. He right. said that. Right. And he, the creepy thing is he actually even signed the tweet from your brother. And so that if he's our brother, why is he looking at us sexually to begin with anyway? Right, right. Why, hmm. does, I mean, why wouldn't it even be his responsibility, as would the Bible tell him, to renew his mind? Mm-hmm. And as well, work out his own salvation in, in, in fear and trembling, not work out the color of clothing and or the type of clothing that women have on. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it is really disturbing. And, you know, when my daughter, I've, I've shared this many times, but when my youngest was 11, um, she was told by her son, Sunday school teacher, who was a woman, by the way, um, that she needed to stop wearing V-necks or any sweaters that came very low because now she was developing and, you know, so the men at church would be looking at her and we had a hard time getting her to go to church for the next few weeks. Oof. But you know, it's often women who spread this message too. Yeah, and I, and I think they have been certainly indoctrinated into this culture that is led by toxic patriarchy. And to a large degree, I think Christians are not willing to call out this kind of behavior, this mentality. So we're, 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 we find ourselves in many of these churches just going along to get along. I, I do believe we know better because if we look at the church, the molestations, the rapes, the sexual harassment, 
a, a pastor just a few months ago um, was trolling and got caught up in a sting for underage prostitutes. 15 years old. He's trying to make a date with her online, makes the date, goes to the date. It's an actual sting. Mm. He gets arrested. That was a Friday. He walks in the pulpit on Sunday as if nothing happened. Oh, seriously? Seriously. The board had to actually, after, after backlash, after it hit the news and newspapers, had to actually ask him not to get back into the pulpit. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, this is what I mean by this, this, this is very dangerous because it normalizes a behavior and, 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 a, and a mentality that, and as I said, in the case where this guy steps back into the pulpit, why wouldn't every woman have walked out of that church mm -hmm. in protest? Mm -hmm. That's not making sense to me, Sheila. That's not making sense to me. I wonder, you know, I've been thinking about that a lot. I've been feeling a big burden for the women who go to this man's church. Because this is blown up. I mean, apparently this tweet has now been seen 20 million times. Right. And it, you know, he's been interviewed in the media and, and, and things like that. Right. Um, but I wonder, you know, are they, do they even know that this is wrong? Or are they just so brainwashed? Brainwashed, yeah. And one of the things that I really appreciate you about you, Patrick, is that you're so, like, you don't mince words. You know, like everyone's got to go right now, go to Facebook, look up Patrick Weaver Ministries and follow his Facebook page. That's how I found you. I think Sarah McDougall was sharing you. And I, anyway, so Patrick Weaver Ministries, go follow him. But you don't mince words. And, and you're really calling out this entitlement mindset. And that's what it is. That is so much in the church. And that is so wrapped up in abuse. Right. How do we get more men to start doing what you're doing because I sometimes feel like I'm in the sea of women who are upset but how do we get the men on board and Sheila I think that's where that's where the rubber meets the road because until men overwhelmingly join this movement I think we're going to have a lot of arguments debates and certainly draw a lot of attention to the advocacy but i think it won't get the traction unless and until we get participation by the very people who are perpetrating these abuses mm -hmm. men need to hear from men i don't know if it's the language in in, in some instances and i and, and i was talking to tom at um Psalm oh, 82. 82. Yeah. yeah. He made a statement about advocates versus activists. Mm -hmm. And activists who, for their reasons and their agenda, but for this small reason and small agenda, are, act, are, are, are advocates. But a lot of that language is incorrect and or can almost turn the entire movement against men mm -hmm. who are not speaking correctly or saying something accurately. Uh, I'll give you an example. You made a statement about a study you had done which showed a lesser percentage mm -hmm. of men, Christian men, who use porn. Yeah. That's what the advocacy community, which I would refer more so to activist community, mm -hmm. but they refer to. In that same instance, the quote unquote activist community turned against the advocacy community because mm -hmm. they didn't like the number. Yeah, I know. I've been I've been really a victim of friendly fire over that because we found we found fifty percent of it, men currently use porn instead of 80 percent yeah and in their percentage though they are talking about abusers mm -hmm. they're not talking about men at large yeah 
talking about swaths or groups of men with certain proclivities, mm -hmm. certain characteristics. But in any pocket, there will be a deviation from that mean. Yeah. Right? But the response was attack without mm -hmm. even consideration for fact. They can't walk into every single community in the United States of America and get the same statistic. That's not possible, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's how men feel attacked by advocacy. Mm -hmm. And I think as much as we need men, we're going to have to recognize in, 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 a, in, a, in a lot of ways some of the activists are using words like all men, mm -hmm. right? And as you even address so well, the all men books and, and all men lust and all men crazy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but that's going to have to be done more because mm -hmm. I think men are finding these waters murky. If mm -hmm. they say anything, they'll be attacked. If they have an opinion that differs, they'll be attacked. Mm -hmm. If they have a reality that differs, they're going to be attacked. So are they really invited? Mm -hmm. That's the big mm -hmm. question we've got to ask ourselves as advocates is, are they invited and even invited ignorant? Or do they need to be uh, specialists in trauma and have the lingo? And if they make a mistake in wording, are they going to just be assassinated? Right. That's actually, that's a really good point for social media interaction. Cause you know, there have been some guys, especially on my Facebook page that, how do I say this ni nicely? You know, they're trying, but they're not there. And, yeah. and then yeah. a lot of people jump on them and I've tried to be patient and continue to educate. And they're now some of my biggest supporters, but it took a long time to get there. But like, but like we got to not, not jump when someone's heart is in the right place and they're really trying to learn. And they're trying to learn and they're trying to learn yeah. they just don't have the language or the exposure yeah and, and that can be hard because as women we're so used to always being attacked and we just want people to see our side without having to always be patient and it's difficult it's difficult to be patient when you're the one who's always been hurt by this but i think if we do want to see change i think what's so important is to to go back to what Jesus did and treat everybody like an individual and not like a group. Right, a mob. It's, it's, so, yeah. important. it's so important. Mm -hmm. Because I often wonder, wow, if the guy had the nerve to speak mm -hmm. environment, which has that tendency, imagine if he would have been educated in an encouraging way. Yeah left knowing something more than he came with mm -hmm. as opposed to having to defend what he really didn't understand which only right. which only spirals out of control because he's defending something now that he believes has insulted him and or has confused him with other men when that was never really the intent right so he's defending what never was in question yeah but the way that he's being spoken to it only emboldens his defense right because now he's thinking well geez this is proof i'm being attacked yes yes and i and i and that's why i love your page i love your page that's why i always comment on it because at the end of day there are people out there who are making this possible i've never seen you make a comment to someone male or female that did not give them the backdrop, the understanding, and the encouragement so that they knew how to participate in the dialogue. I've never seen you not do that. Thank you. I, I feel like, <laughs> well, thank you. And I, you know, I, I would say the same about you. I think that you're very, um, you're very pastoral. Like you put, you put these things that do not mince words as your, um, you know, as a, as a, post but then in the comments you're always very pastoral to people so i think that's very helpful too um it's, it's just caring. do you think sheila that there that that will be a bridge that we will will fix in the near term i think that there's a huge sea change occurring 
And I, I, I think I think we need to define what our, our goals are too, because it's like what Jesus said, the poor will always be with you. Okay. <laughs> and he didn't mean he didn't mean you're not supposed to fight poverty, or you're not supposed to fight for justice, or you're not supposed to fight oppression. You know, he it's just we're never gonna win right. entirely, right. right? Like we live in a fallen world until Jesus comes back, until he sets things right, there's always gonna be problems. And so we can't we can't judge victory by changing the minds of people like Brian Sove. Yeah, that's how I feel too. You know, there's always going to be Brian, there's always going to be Emerson Eglitch. Right. There's always going to be books like Love and Respect. The problem is not that there is an Emerson Eglitch or that there's a Steve Arterburn writing Every Man's Battle. The problem is that people are buying it and that they're getting popular. And so <laughs> right. we can't stop the fringe. All we can do is hopefully make it more fringe. Yeah, right, exactly. And I think that's also another reason, you know, on your page where you really give us the uh, blow by blow details that give us the ability to understand how this content, public content uh, books, how they actually relate to the problem, right? Yeah. In an unbiased way. And, 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 I, and I think the more that that's done by the advocacy community not just by one or two or three but the advocacy community has got to start incorporating that pushback in their messaging because not enough folk are aware and that awareness is got to be from the advocacy community at large so imagine if when you push back on garbage science garbage content that only encourages abuse in its language but has been adopted as acceptable christian relationship material imagine if the entire community did that Mm -hmm. imagine then what awareness would be when the next book comes online yes you see there has to be this awareness that the advocacy community is concerned with it can't one way of helping the victims is to encourage sensitivity for information or regarding information that 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 predators use to prey yeah and predators when we hear predator we often think like pedophile predators can be abusive husbands Abuse right. It, on their wife. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Intimate partner predator. And a lot mm-hmm. of this, most of this stuff actually is what emboldens the intimate partner predator, uh, mm-hmm. creates or puts more gas in that victim's gas chamber through the language, through the covert messaging that normalizes abuse and, and in any other uh circumstance or 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 in any other conversation it would just simply be called abuse but the folk and the pornified and the um depraved put it in a christian relationship book and we actually call it god's way (laughs) it's confusing but without that kind of crowd support for the rebuke of these books I'm even wondering why, what's the incentive for these authors to, to stop writing this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because if no one says anything, or if only a few, but they can make a bundle of money, yeah. why stop? Yeah. That's, that's, the, that's the scary thing to me. Yeah. And that's why I know I met you when we were, I guess, right around when Married Sex was launching and, and you were very vocal about about some of the problems about Gary Thomas's objectification of women in that book. Right. Um, and that was, I, I really was encouraged by that. And it's funny because we all were talking about it, but from such different ways. And it, was, it wasn't a coordinated campaign, but it was really the first time where all, the, all of us could kind of know each other on Facebook started doing the same thing. And it really had a big effect. And I think that shows that, that when we do get together and say, no, this is no longer acceptable because this isn't of Jesus. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, right, maybe right. people will, will sit up and listen. Mm-hmm. And I think that's been a large part of why I, 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 
you know, even in in even from what you do, more are encouraged to do it. I've never seen more people do that, that being critique book and respond publicly using their platform to garbage material, uh, masquerading as Christian uh, relationship uh, book. I, I've never seen more people do that since you started doing it. Yeah. And so that's, that's, that's why I say every, seems like every move, which I think this is a move of God, mm -hmm. uh, this, this is how Jesus would have wanted us to react, respond, and defend the oppressed. Not be tolerant, not be complicit, but be vocal, emboldened, and determined through the Holy Spirit to free minds from dangerous, ungodly content. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Patrick. I really appreciate this. I appreciate your partnership in the gospel and in what we do. And everybody right now, pause this podcast while you're listening and go to Facebook and find Patrick Weaver Ministries. He's awesome. I guess you're on, you're on Instagram too. I've never followed you on Instagram. I should, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same man but go find him and, and you'll really be encouraged by him so thank you so much we'll have to have you back on again to talk about abuse one day but, <laughs> but I appreciate this <laughs> Patrick is a really great guy oh yeah yeah and I I, I, I love um, getting to introduce you all to new people and I hope you go follow him at the end of the podcast we like to give some encouragement mm -hmm. um, and on our Facebook group we've been doing some Facebook lives people are starting to read the early copies of yes. the books that they've been getting if they pre-ordered and again you can join that now like you can join our, our Facebook group and our pre-order launch team launch team sounds really scary all it means <laughs> is that you're going to read the book early and leave a review you. that's yeah. all it means and so you can do that by pre-ordering and following the link in the in the show notes um but somebody gave me a really good compliment and yeah. i thought that i would share that okay. she said that reading the good girl's guide was like a warm hug from a friend oh that's and i so thought nice. you know because i just feel like there's so much ugliness that is often mm. about sex in the church and she said this just felt like really beautiful yeah. and wonderful and so yeah and that's that the vision feel... we want to have for what sex should be yeah. Christian couples. Yeah. yeah, that's how we want to start people out is, hey, this is, this is, so if you know someone who's about to get married, if you're about to get married, if you're early in your marriage, if you've never figured sex out, this is a great book to figure out the orgasm gap, to figure out how her body works, either for women or for men. And you can read them as a couple and then do the discussion questions afterwards too. So mm -hmm. do check those out. We will put a link in the show notes. And thank you for joining us on the Bear Marriage Podcast. Uh, we will see you again next week where we share some more stuff from our men's survey and from our new book. So see you then. Bye-bye.